Hello everybody, how are you? I'm very happy to be here with you today to continue with Realistic Ethical Evolutionary Action. And uh, I just want to emphasize again how proud of myself I am <laughs> uh, to have noted that the karma theory, instead of being thought of as some sort of mystical, like far out thing, that's a woo-woo thing, you know, karma. People say, oh, karma, that's my karma. It's a, it's a word in the English language, and who knows how the dictionary actually interprets it. But actually, what it means is evolution. Darwin was preceded by thousands of years by Shakyamuni Buddha as uh, discovering uh, how we are what we are, and that we are actually evolutionary beings, that we are, um, uh, that we are connected to the animals, we humans, and even that, you know, we are animals. And not only that we are animals, but that we have been animals. Where he would say, well, our genes have been the animals of genes. Like they say from the genome uh, decoding that they've done recently, having discovered the genome, that the human is 85% chimpanzee. That is to say, we share the same pattern of genes as the, as the human. Furthermore, the, the genes of our microbiome are billions. You know, there's like a huge number, only 23,000 we have, but the genes of the little animals, the micro animals in the micro infinity of life. Because when you go down towards zero, you know what? You never get to zero. First of all, there is no such thing as zero. And therefore, you can keep magnifying and going into the micro infinitely. You can have universes in an atom. And we can be an atom in a different dimension of macro universe. Once you have infinity, all beds are off, everything is possible, and so on. But the living being then, even we say genes, even we say karma, even we say evolution, even we say animal, in Buddhist science, nothing is final. There is no final theory <coughs> that exactly corresponds to absolutely everything that exists. What actually exists is, in fact, uh, indescribable. And therefore, what are, but which doesn't mean, and then some people say, well, that's terrible. Then all our words, all our theories, all our descriptions are useless. No, they're not useless. They are valuable. They give us an angle on things. They give us an aspect of things. They enable us to open up more and be more realistic and observe more by having something that aims us in a certain direction. But it's just, it's just like aiming a gun at something very precisely doesn't the same as hitting the thing. You have to fire the bullet and it hits it. So therefore we aim through a theory at, rea at some reality and we observe it, but to actually fully grasp that reality we go beyond whatever any word can tell us because there's a million other aspects and a million other angles and vectors and dimensions to what we look at. For example, you take a photograph of something. So you photograph that wall and say, well, that's exactly what that wall is. No, it isn't. The wall, the photograph is limited by coming from a certain distance, certain dimension, certain direction, from within the thing, at the subatomic level what it is. It's completely beyond what the photograph can register. And therefore, that doesn't mean we don't bother to take a photograph. We do. You get it? So in Buddhist science, even the theory of karma, even the theory of evolution, is not the reality of karma, not the reality of evolution. So theories of life are helpful and useful to help us gain a better experience of life, better appreciation of life, but they are not substitute for living life. All right? And actually, that's not some sort of pessimism. That's science, meaning that there's always more to observe, more to experience, more to find out about, more to enjoy, actually. So that's actually a very good thing. All right. But within that, then, the Darwinian theory was brilliant, and it helped human beings in the West who had this idea that you know God created animals and humans, but only the human had the intelligence that was the same as God's. 
and the other rest is just you know dirt molded into clay, which caused people to abuse animals and not realize that animals are sentient and sensitive, and they feel pain and they should be not treated so badly. And uh, of course, they sometimes they you know you have predators that do eat other animals, and they didn't hear, they didn't get the memo, <laughs> and they get hungry. So, but we do have it, and we could learn actually not to have to eat animals. We would maybe still have to defend ourselves against certain types of predators, yes, micro predators like viruses that kill you, you know, or bacteria that do the wrong kind of thing, that flesh eating bacteria or something. They have some vicious kind. But that doesn't mean that we would purposely torment, torture, or treat them as if they didn't exist. That's what they are. So, anyway, Buddha. The other good thing about Buddha's version of a Darwinian theory of the interconnectedness of all life is that we personally get the fruit of our good evolutionary actions. We personally experience the negative consequence, the, the blowback, the bad rebound, the what goes around comes around, negative effects of our negative actions. Harmful to others, then that ends up harming ourselves, in other words. Being good to others ends up being, bringing goodness to ourselves within the relational framework of life. And that's really good, whereas the Darwinian one is part of the whole silly thing that we're all really nothing, that's what we really are, and we have the illusion of existing because of the, our brain makes us think we exist, and, but our consciousness is nothing but a side effect of our brain, which is basically just a robot looking for food or something. It's just an animal thing that wants us to eat more. <laughs> and, and therefore, the whole thing is meaningless because we're really nothing. So the logical thing for Darwin, if you have any serious suffering, should kill yourself, and then you're anesthetized eternally, and you don't have to worry about a thing. And that was lead to our careless and reckless culture that is actually destroying our home. And that's too bad. So it's a bad side effect. The good side effect of Buddha's Darwinian karma theory, evolutionary theory, his evolutionary karma theory is that any good things we do can be magnified infinitely and we can become the ultimate good, which is a Buddha, to find us beyond even being a god. We can also become gods, but those are temporary conditions, like our present human one. And although it's good, to, it's fun to be, it can be very fun to be a god. But you know, for temporary, and it's a big bring down when you lose being a god, because you get indulged that you're a god. And so it's better to be a Buddha where there's no come down, because you, you have divine pleasure, bliss, joy, and love, and vision, and you also don't separate yourself from even beings in hell, and therefore you're incredibly competent to help them get out of hell, or not even get into it in the first place. So it's like a vision of reality as making possible, as if we're being ultimately good, and making possible that beings can then themselves become ultimately good. And one of the most valuable way station toward that is being human. Because human has divine intelligence, they're not wrong on that, the theist, the monotheist, but human has the animal vulnerability this, and sensitivity. So therefore, they don't, they're not complacent. You get to be a pleasure god, you lounge around, it's like a 10 million year jacuzzi. You sort of forget about bothering to really understand what's going on. And you, and you become too complacent, you're not vulnerable. Until finally, then they say, when a god suddenly realizes they're going to die and lose their divine position, because the positive things they did in the past that bring them this positive condition, of divinity in a good environmental heaven, heaven, heavenly environment, has worn out its force, and some negative thing maybe is now going to bring them down in a bad state, and they're, they're so indulged, it's like they're weakened by being just all pleasure, and so they might not be able to handle it very well. So they say that misery renders even thousand years of bliss feel as if it never happened. So anyway, I talked about this already last time. I don't need to elaborate too much, but it's a marvelous idea. And I think if the Darwinians, uh, current modern biology people, 
if they will get off this dogma that the, that the human being has no brain, no mind, and no soul, and that you are you escape from the danger of suffering, and in fact from any suffering, you become anesthetized by becoming nothing at death, which is just a dogma. Because guess what? They never discovered nothing. Nobody did. Even you go unconscious at night and you're asleep and your consciousness become you become unconscious. That's not nothing. You're still there and you keep waking up. You have a dream, and there's a law of conservation of energy, and your awareness is a subtle energy continuum. And so it's more logical and more natural that there's a flow of that. And you are responsible, just like you wouldn't do something to your body this year that you know would give you terrible suffering next year. So when you know there's a next life, you wouldn't do something that would cause you, really put you in a bad state and a bad situation next life. If you knew that, you would be more careful. And it's not up to some person. Nobody, they think, you know, Westerners, monotheists think, and not just Western, any monotheist, Indian one or Chinese one too, they think that God will put an unbeliever or a bad person in hell. No. God actually is much nicer than they give him credit for. They just say that to frighten people into trying to behave, you know, to be moral based on a sort of fear of punishment routine like we do in the normal, you know, like justice system, let's call it. But that's not the, you make your own negative condition, actually. God does not do it to anybody. God is a happy, happy camper. Why would he bother to throw beings in hell? If he is omnipotent, if he was omnipotent, he would never do that. It, the fact that that happens proves he's not omnipotent. Because you know that when you're in a really good mood, you have no motive to harm another person and be mean to them. And why would they, if your image of God do that? No way. That's just added to visionary experiences by religious prophets and religious mystics, by justice officials, by the police department of the king. They add that frightening thing in order to make people, intimidate people to not be bad. So they have a reason to do it, but don't believe in it. It makes no sense. So we're responsible to some extent for our own condition. Of course, other people affect us, but a lot about what we make our own situation is by doing, doing unto others what they don't want. So now we come to the negative navigating, how to navigate. Once you realize that your every thought, your every verbal statement, your every physical action is uh, shaping your future existence, you become much more careful about it. You want to have good thoughts, good speech, and good acts. Me good meaning helpful to others and not harmful. Speech pleasant to others and not unpleasant. Action gentle to others and not rough and violent. Okay. Just a general thing. So there is a story that in a previous life of the Buddha, he received a set of teachings from a great sage when he was a, when Buddha was a bodhisattva, that is to say, someone in search of becoming a perfect being, who who felt that who real, who felt responsible for their own condition at least to the major extent, not you know, denying others' impact, but mainly their own will having force and being responsible for that. That person then, given an infinite context of life, where anything is possible, they then realize they better dedicate their life toward whatever is the practical way to become really happy and to be able to make that around you really happy, beings around you really happy. And then you become, that makes you a bodhisattva, meaning someone who wishes to be a Buddha. Because a perfectly enlightened and perfectly blossomed being, is, that's just what it's called. It's called a Buddha. It's not a personal thing. You're not trying to become somebody else. You're trying to become your own best person. And that's called, when you do, you'll be called a Buddha by people who, a, a blossomed, enlightened, awakened being. You'll be called that. In a previous life of Buddha, when he was a bodhisattva, he received a set of teachings from a great sage who wanted him to value them so much that he demanded the bodhisattva, enlightening hero, 
use his own skin as a sheet of paper. So a little bit of suffering, a little bit of asceticism, he, let's say he's demanded of that guy. <laughs> Make a quill pen from one of his finger bones, dreadful, and write down the pattern of the tenfold path of positive evolutionary action and its, its mirror opposite negative evolutionary action um, uh, with his own blood for ink. The sage then, and apparently that Bodhisattva was so, so concerned to know that, and he was in some almost mythical cultural situation where it wasn't generally known because actually it gets quite generally known. So there's a very, very primordial story. Uh, and he went through that agony of doing that cutting a piece of skin, I guess writing in really small letters with a very minute amount of blood, and the finger bone thing is really horrible. He had to cut off a piece of finger, so I had a very little pen, I hope. I hope he just cut off one joint and then filed off a little sharp thing. Let's hope. It's awful, the idea of it. The sage then recited to him the negative ten and the positive ten together, which the Bodhisattva wrote down in the briefest shorthand, we have to hope. He had skin in the game, you could say. That's a cheap pun, really. So he worked for brevity. To put the, and then there's this other wonderful thing, which I think I already mentioned last time, but just to repeat, the word for virtuous versus unvirtuous, or virtuous and vicious, sinful and, and um, moral, or sinful and non-sinful, etc., however you want to make that duality, good and bad and good. The word for that, kushala, in Sanskrit originally, was also a word for skillful and unskillful, skillful and clumsy. And, well, and that's very strange. Why would you call virtue, what do we think of virtue? Just we think of it as good, because we're following a rule, Ten Commandments or something, or the law of the land, and so we think we're being good. So we're just following rules. So that, that doesn't take skill. It just takes obedience to the rule, right? Whereas these are, in a way, not really rules. I mean, they are actually also rules. They're used as rules for people who don't understand. But remember, the Buddha's whole movement is really more educational than it is religious. It doesn't help so much to believe this and that as it does to know it. Because when you know it, you don't feel you're obeying, you feel you're consciously doing the right thing. Because you've internalized that that's the best thing to do for you and for everybody else. And therefore, you, how skillful are you in doing the right thing is the key thing. So, and that turns out to be what is most virtuous and most moral. I already mentioned that, but I think it's quite marvelous because it's part of him emphasizing our agency in uh, doing the, what's right. That, you know, living well is living skillfully because you are the agent of your own destiny. You are the agent of your own joy, your own success, your own fulfillment. It doesn't just necessarily depend on some, sort of, some circumstance or some other thing. It really shows you to respect your own will, actually. Cultivate a positive will because that's the determining factor. Okay, so now there's said to be three skillful and unskillful bodily actions. And they are, the unskillful one is not taking lives, not killing, basically. Thou shalt not kill. It is the first commandment, isn't it? In the Ten Commandments. I think it's the first one. And uh, heaven knows, as a professor, I've had so many papers comparing this tenfold path of evolutionary action with the Ten Commandments and also the laws of Manu that I should remember, but I don't, I, I confess. I'm retired now. But I think Thou shalt not kill is a pretty prominent one anyway, and possibly the first. And then there's an opposite to not taking others' lives, depriving them of their lives, and that is saving their life. So another being, no other being wants to give up their life. Even if it's in your idea, and you, from your point of view, not the best life they can have, it's quite rare that they want to kill themselves. Sometimes they will, for either positive or negative motives, they will sometimes do that. 
but uh, and various kinds of positive motives or kind of negative. Positive could be to give yourself to save another life, you know, or uh, you know, some form of heroism, you know. A negative one would be to think you can escape from some terrible, shameful, pub, you know, horrible, torturous situation. To be when you're being tortured is something you, the, the body almost will put you in shock and cause you even to die. Torturers are skilled at making you in pain enough where it doesn't kill you. You know that's so they can get what they want out of you. You know, right? Which is just killing you is not torturing you; it's just killing you. So saving lives is the opposite, and that's really the best. The more life you save. And this has to do with sort of the ultimate way of being is a being who is aware that they are all other beings at the same time, that life is one vast ocean of life force. That's the ultimate best kind of being, because then you're for everybody, and since you are everybody else, they're all for you. You know, that's what a Buddha that's why a Buddha is happy, he doesn't afraid of anybody, he can overcome even a devil because he finds the good side of the devil. The devil feels loved by a Buddha, so actually the devil even likes a Buddha, even though they might still do a devilish thing. They actually like Buddhas. <laughs> they do. Yeah. So, not taking lives. And so the thing is, when you take a life, what you're saying is that the owner of that life, because although you may have a theory that they don't have a mind or a soul and they don't really know that they're alive, they're just robots then if you might have that theory, but we know that we feel we have our life and it's a tre treasured thing to us. And therefore, if somebody deprives us of our life, we are mad about it. We try to avoid it. We, are mad. we don't want it. We, we appeal the verdict, you know, if we're, if we're sentenced to death, you know. So we know that other beings like their lives too, even if they're just a lizard or something, they like being a lizard. And so taking it away is to deny the excess, the existence of them and their agency. And it is, in a way, negating that they exist. And it's isolating me also then from that person because I did that harmful deed to them. So therefore, in a way, it narrows my own conception of life. Our natural tendency to identify with others and empathize with them, the wonderful sensitivity of the human being, how we can be so loving, how we can have so much pleasure loving others, is we, we deprive ourselves of that if we kill someone. Because we, their life has nothing to do with me. So my life cannot possibly be connected to them. Whereas, you know, there are all cultures, when you save a life, the person whose life you save, they feel somehow connected to you, like your child or something, so they, they want to repay your kindness, they want to save your life if possible, usually. And then you feel kind of like they are your extension, like a parent feels about their child. So you feel you've expanded your life, so you, you are more, more than one being. You're the burn you saved as well. Like, you, like people feel about their family. You know? They feel we're a family, I'm not just the one isolated person. I have my kids, I have my wife, I have my uncles, my friends. You know, we're, we're a little tribe, we're a little clan. And we like each other, usually. Sometimes we have arguments. And we, we, we don't satisfy each other, we get annoyed, but uh, we basically like each other. So, so we sort of, then you're a bigger life when you have adopted other beings' lives as to be as important as your own, then you have a bigger life. And you're, the biggest life then is a Buddha, where he adopts, they say, a Buddha has adopted all beings, become as important to a Buddha, even bad ones, as a mother adopts her only child and feels like one with her only child and committed to the well-being of her only child. So a Buddha is committed to other beings like that. The difference being that Buddha can really assure the well-being of the other one. They have the power to do that, the knowledge they do that. Although frustratingly for a Buddha, I imagine, is that they can't force the other one to be happy and to be aware. Because you can only be really happy and aware when you understand yourself and the world you're in and therefore are naturally skillful in how you exist and even how you breathe. You breathe skillfully. That is, your breath is an expression of total gratitude to the plants, to the planet, to life. You know, like we toast, you know, to life, à la vie, you know, l'ohaim, you know. And uh, when you breathe, is a toast to life. And you say, thank you for the oxygen, you to the leaves and the plants. 
that it radiates oxygen to us after taking away our karmic waste, our carbon waste. Okay? So then second harmful, most harmful thing you can do to somebody is steal their stuff. You don't steal their life, but you take their part of their body, you know, if you're a cannibal, or their clothes, or their food, or their or whatever, indirectly, whatever property they might have, you take it. So then you sort of dis, you dispossess them, and you ignore uh, their sense that they kind of are, extend their life feeling about their possessions, their relations, their connections, you take them away. So it's kind of it's a kind of killing through, but it's, just, it's not as bad. But it's it's still bad, and um, the opposite of that is you're generous and you give your own stuff to them, to people, and you you don't get attached to things. You love to give it away. You love to see the pleasure of others getting them, and so taking what is not given to you is a very strict definition of stealing, and then giving whatever anybody wants, whatever you can get rid of. Is considered the opposite. Living in a way, but although it's very important, it's impractical to give everything away because then you'll starve to death and freeze to death. So the generosity would be you'd be willing to, in the circumstance where you had another thing or you was warm or you know you were in a situation where you could manage and you wouldn't become a burden to others. So the generosity is the open-minded, detached attitude to your possessions. And, and the willingness to take pleasure in others' sense of pleasure on owning them. You know, like when we, have, we give a present in Hanukkah or Christmas or Kwanzaa, and then the real pleasure for the parent is the joy of the child. You know. By the time they're parents, they don't really enjoy getting a present. That's why if you're smart, to a grown-up, you give a present with the, with the price tag and the receipt connected to it so they can exchange it if they don't like it because you never know exactly what they're going to like. So that's the skill of giving. You know. So not taking what is not given and giving everything. And then finally, the third one for the body. These are the three physical, skillful and unskillful, virtuous or vicious evolutionary acts. And the third one is engaging in harmful sexuality or sex, and then engaging, the opposite being engaging in beneficial sex. Now, the commandment is, thou shalt not commit adultery. And uh, so, uh, adultery is uh, where maybe, you know, you have an adulterous affair with somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband, and you yourself are married uh, to a husband or a wife, depending on your gender. And so it's, that's double adultery. If, it's you, if you just are not married, if you're a bachelor or something, you, it can be single adultery. So, and that causes social harm to the person often, unless they say they're leaving their spouse after a divorce, it's different. But otherwise, it tends, it tends in most societies to cause social harm. The other person is jealous, you get in a fight, or maybe a uh, you know, pa- crime of passions are committed. Or there's financial damage to a broken up family and so forth. It's harmful to children if there are children. So in that sense, it's a harmful sexuality. Use it as harm. And then loving sexuality is when the pleasure of being with another person, giving yourself to another person sort of idea, is uh, beneficial. They like it. It doesn't destroy a family. It maybe creates one, etc. And it's pleasurable. And so it's funny in the positive acts in the Ten Commandments says nothing about have good sex. <laughs> have, have helpful sex. They don't bother to mention it. They, I guess they assume it tends to be illicit. Passion, you know, there's, a, there's the trope of the passion, the forbidden passion, you know, forbidden fruit. But in the, in the Buddhist, and, and actually Buddhism, they translate this as no, do not, they just translate the same, no adultery. But there's, you know, there's sadism, you know, there's weird kinky stuff. There's things that it's unhealthy to another person. You know, not only not only adultery actually. So harmful sexuality is good. And why that is a major problem is because <clears throat> since enlightenment comes from a being who becomes very very open and generous, and they're open-minded and they don't fanatic about even ideas and they 
don't insist on killing someone just because they get angry with them or they don't like them. They don't insist on possessing something just because they're obsessed with it, even if it causes harm or they commit crime to do it. So they're able to control themselves and so on. So and the, the sexual act is where biologically the human anyway, who really can, who, which is a life form that can enjoy. We have like good foreplay, you know, and afterplay, and we can really have bliss, and we can give, we can, we can convey bliss, bestow bliss on another. We can be blissful ourselves, receive a kind of experience of bliss. And so at that time, when biologically speaking, our life form is such that there is the sort of the ideal is where you do melt into another being, and they melt into you. Is the ideal of fantasy, you know, and to use that abusively in some way to consider the other being as just an instrument of your pleasure to harm them in some way uh, is particularly negative. Is particularly bad. So those three: killing, stealing, and harmful sexuality are the three negative and unskillful evolutionary acts of the body, and saving lives, giving gifts, and and engaging in only positive sexual interaction with others, loving sexual interaction with others, careful sexual interaction with others, caring, and so on. Uh, those are the physical ones. And, and, quite, and they all notice, they all have to do with expanding your sense of being by identifying with others, or contracting it by withdrawing into your own self-imagined boundaries and being harmful to others which then creates a bad wave against you from them, of course, because they resent being harmed. Everybody does. Even the masochist eventually gets mad at their sadists <laughs> because when it gets really lethal, they don't like it. So, uh, so that's very easy to understand. Now, there, now, then this one is a little unusual, although we have them in the Ten Commandments. No blasphemy, I think. No lying. I think those are the two main ones in the Ten Commandments, if I remember rightly. No slander, maybe. Uh, so that's three. Well, there are four of speech. And speech is a part of our evolution. And speech is particularly amazing for humans because it's where our sociality, our interconnectedness with other beings, especially other humans, is, or beings above us, divine angels or gods, uh, is manifested. So on the speech level, we're kind of a group being because we use language, and language only is useful if both sides have some sense of the meaning of what you're saying. So it really is an interpersonal, it's an intra-being, where you really have bigger interbeing is when you're speaking or listening to another speak. So it's very, it's sort of, you're in that expanded place of either entering another's mind through speech and making them think of something that you're thinking of, however imperfectly, or letting them come into your mind and being by trying to imagine what they are meaning as they are speaking. So it's where mind-to-mind -mind transmission occurs through speech, usually, actually. And uh, so there are four of speech. L not lying. Lying is unskillful. Skillful is telling, tr telling the truth being transparent to the other and revealing at least what you think is the reality. So speaking the truth. You might still be wrong, actually, so you might actually be not speaking accurately, but at least as far as you're concerned, you're speaking, you're revealing whatever you think you know. And the opposite of that is you lie, and then you create a false world for the other, and you weaken their uh, sense of reality by... Uh, <coughs> By misleading them and uh, making trouble for them, so that's uh, so. So your your empathy and your interconnectedness is lessened by lying, and increased by telling the truth. Not speaking divisively, uh, or speaking re reconcilingly or diplomatically. So the negative thing is to speak to sell someone something, to make them dislike someone else. And people often do that to sort of act like, I'm your best friend. So by the way, the other person you thought your best friend, they really hate your guts and they did this and that and the other. And then you're making them enemies of each other and then you're their buddy, you know. It's sort of, it's the, it is what diplomacy tries to do. It tries to make an alliance against an enemy by convincing the one you want to ally with that the enemy is bad for them. 
And that's what, in fact, the bad type of speech is, actually. So our normal diplomacy is uh, national self-centered diplomacy is actually bad speech, unskillful action. Skillful action is make your make other enemies reconcile each other so they're not unple so they're happy with each other. And that way they both will be happy with you, and that's what diplomacy should be doing. And actually good diplomats I think do do that. They try to reconcile other people. And uh, they harmonize because actually if they have war with each other, then ultimately they'll probably have war with you is the idea. So actually long term speaking diplomatically and reconcilingly is skillful and speaking divisively is unskillful. Okay? And similarly, speaking harshly and abusing people and, and insulting them, and etc., this has a tendency to make them angry and make them angry with you and intense, increase your separation from them. And um, it's like harming them, and, it, and there'll be bad blowback from that. Besides, it will hurt their feeling. So that's unskillful. And the opposite of that is to speak sweetly to them and pleasantly to them. And the ultimate of that is Taylor Swift is a Beethoven, is a Mozart. Music, good, great musicians are the most sweet speakers. Poets are sweet speakers. Buddhas are great uh, speakers and musicians and poets. So the opposite is speaking sweetly and pleasantly to others. And finally, uh, and they don't have a blasphemy. If you say Buddha's bad or something, he doesn't mind. It's not like that he'll throw you in hell for that. <laughs> he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't mind. You, he, well, he thinks it's unfortunate for you if you think that, or if you persuade others of that, it's not a good idea. But he doesn't mind it. But what he does mind is when you just, when you abuse the privilege of presenting yourself in the mind of another, by, and therefore taking up their time and space with your thoughts, when you just babble senselessly what you don't even know about. This is sometimes translated as gossiping, but it's not. But gossiping is not necessarily that bad if you're speaking truth, if you're speaking sweetly, and if you're speaking reconcilingly. That could be good. Oh, you know, so and so really likes you. He told me good things about you yesterday. That could be sweet speech and diplomatic speech. So it's not just gossiping. It's just speaking senselessly, or it's like a fake teacher who doesn't really know what they're teaching but just babbles, and then people get all they make notes and everything, and they get more confused. So that, that's the opposite of that is speaking meaningfully, knowing what they need, what is good for them, knowing what they're capable of and helping them find it. So speaking the Dharma, as they say, speaking the teachings about what reali rea reality is, help, speaking realistically is the opposite of that. Instead of babbling senselessly, it's speaking meaningfully and realistically. So those are the four of speech. Don't lie, don't backbite, don't be harsh and don't babble senselessly and tell the truth. Be reconciling others to each other. Speak sweetly or sing to them, ideally even, and speak meaningfully, helpfully to others, realistically. So those are those four. And they're wonderful, I think, really. And as again, they are some of them, you know, the no blasphemy would be to speak meaningfully and don't speak blasphemously in monotheism, because there they're really worried about God's feelings. They don't want to hurt his feelings by saying bad things or create your own bad attitude and reinforce a bad attitude toward the divine. And that's a good idea. Well, why hurt God's feelings? God is another person too. And um, he has very well-meaning, I believe, mostly. The gods that have lasted are quite well-meaning. Demons are not well-meaning. Gods are, tend to be well-meaning. So then, then, then those are seven, and now we have three of mind, and that, that explains why in cultures that are, are, have this kind of biological awareness, realize that they, li they are living in evolutionary time, realizing that their acts of body and speech interacting overtly with others are meaningful to them and important to them and evolutionarily determining to them, then the awful thing is the things you think in your mind also are like that. It isn't like your thoughts have no power. They have tremendous power. You know, we know that, you know, the secret reveals that. They claim that if you 
say I'm going to be a millionaire. I want a million dollars. Long, I deserve a million dollars. Long enough, you'll get a million dollars, which is a little simplistic indeed. But in a way, it's correct. You affirm that. You affirm that. You get rid of feeling that you don't deserve it. You don't. You you know you. You know, that, there's that famous thing on Saturday Night Live, Stuart Smalley, who talks to himself, looks himself in the mirror and says, gee, Stuart, you're so great. You know, you're really a fine fellow and all this kind of thing. And, he says, and that makes him go out and have a good day and expect the best. So that's fun, you know. But of course, it's, it's not, it's not the, it, is, it is magical if it's really sustained, you know. And it, but it's not like just because you wish for this, it's going to happen. That, that, then you get disappointed if you think that. So uh, in a short term, term. But on the other hand, the mind is very, very powerful. And this is why in cultures that are aware of that, there is an emphasis on coming to know your own mind. Be de- becoming Even extroverts should become introspective. And in a way, this you could say that meditation of course, there's many other meditations. You can meditate on being ignoring yourself. You can meditate on all kinds of stupid things. But meditating on what my own true nature is, how my mind works, what is deeper in my mind, even what is in my unconscious mind, and how can I assure that my unconscious energies are all heading skillfully toward the good, and they're not greedily or angrily or confusedly going toward the bad. That becomes really important, you know. The key thing in Buddhist psychology is to become a master of your own unconscious, which I think like the, the Hercules myth of the Augean stables is a, is a metaphor for that, I believe. It's like the unconscious. Freud discovered the unconscious is a little bit, it has an Augean stable. It has a swirling bunch of instincts, and especially the self-centeredness is the worst of them. So anyway, the three unskillful and skillful mental actions are not hating, Instead, forgiving and loving others. So that's where your mind is not like a, a rocket coming out to blow somebody up. Your mind is like a therapist wanting to heal them, make them happy. You know, a, a massage therapist, like a lover. Mind wants to love everyone. And, uh, and uh, anything they might have done to you, you want to forgive. And then you just want to love everyone. So that's the positive one. And so therefore, you know, you meditate where you, you won't have a secret satisfaction at some horrible battle where then someone on your side is victorious because they, they've trampled the other people and that makes you very unhappy, you know. So because, and if, because even though you didn't do it, if you mentally reward it and congratulate it and sort of vicariously perform violent acts, you know, in a sense, therefore, get carried away by the hero in a violent movie who's killing people. That's really unfortunate because that is the karma. A little, you get to, it's not as bad as if you kill them yourself, but it creates this sense of isolation, sense that, you're, that the other person's life is, is not good. For example, in the Star Wars series, Lucas did a brilliant thing where there were these clone armies so he could have seeds of scenes of mayhem and slaughter, but they were just breaking robots. So people, they would sort of get sanctified. They'd get the, you know, how good housekeeping seal of approval because they weren't bloodily killing live beings. They were just killing robots. Or maybe in some of the later ones, it gets confusing. Whether yeah, finally one of the latest ones, one of those sort of guys in that white uniform was actually a person. But originally, they were seemed to be insentient robots. So the, the mayhem and slaughter was not sort of reprehensible to the degree it is when you have an actual war movie where they're actually killing another living being, or, or you know, dramatically uh, presenting the killing of one. And then it's considered a bad evolutionary action if you get into it and get them, you know, hit them, kick them all down, shoot them, you know, which you can, which happens in action movies. You get like carried away with the, with the hero, you know, and it's really that's bad karma. It's kill, killing karma, in a, in a more indirect way. Okay, so forgiving and and loving rather than hating. Then second, being detached and generous rather than greedy. And so uh, you know, you don't. Uh, 
do mental porn, you know, you don't do, uh, you know, you don't like lust after people or beings. It's, it's very important for monastics, they learn not to do that. But for anyone, it's very, very negative to do. You're like committing all kinds of sex acts in your imagination, inappropriately, without love, you know, treating the other person just like a tool for your pleasure. And that's a negative thing. Uh, whereas being detached and trying to radiate the positive even without any kind of you know, genital interaction sort of thing, sensual interaction, that's considered the best possible thing. So being detached and generous is good and not being coveting and not, not wanting to like possess others is, is um, it's good to not want to do that and to drop out from anything, anybody who seems to be teaching that. And then finally, and this is, and it's funny, you see, the, the uh, not hating, forgiving, and, and loving is like the mental form of killing or saving lives. Not coveting, but being detached and generous is like the mental form of not stealing, but giving gifts and detaching yourself from material things. And then not being unrealistic, being realistic and, and wise, meaning being detached from things not seeking to own everything and dominate it and so forth, which is unrealistic. And that is an ideology, actually. It's not just going into a mental state. It's holding an ideal, and as people, some people did when in the karmic field, they decided that meant uh, they would move to a different universe rather than possessing away the, the, the yokel's the uh, property, the yokel's body, you know. So the sexual abuse one with the ideological fanaticism are aligned, kind of. Being, that means, it just means becoming really stuck, uh, stuck on some fanatic idea that you have. Instead, being realistic and wise, which is to be sort of detached and allow other things and beings to be themselves without you de 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 decide deciding. You know, f people who have, not necessarily religious fanatics, people can be materialistic, atheist fanatics. The Dalai Lama considers the secularists to be a world religion of over one billion people who don't believe in any sort of invisible thing. And they have a big effort of explaining away anything that people remember or had happened to them on a super subtle core level. And they just forget about that. There's no core level. The body automatically gets recycled, and then the material is recycled, and then you have genes and a new, a new consciousness that has the delusion of thinking that you exist. That's a secular idea. And that the Buddha is disagreeing with. So that's so not hating, not coveting, and not being realistic. Those are the three Skill, unskillful and skillful mental evolutionary acts. And that's why these Buddhist ethics is quite difficult. And that's why it requires meditation, introspection, self-knowledge, and self-control to actually be ethical, because it involves controlling your mind as well. On the good side, it means that there is a special practice it's called congratulatory rejoicing, where when anybody does a good thing, we catch ourselves from a kind of nagging thing that can come up in one's mind of, oh, well, they're not so great. I could have done that too, <laughs> you know, or somebody else did it just as well, and sort of begrudging someone the joy of their success and their effectiveness and their f efficiency and so forth, you know. Oh, they scored a, a, a bases run at home, a bases loaded home run. Oh, well, Reggie, Reggie Jackson did that too, you know. So, you know, there's this way we have of kind of being jealous, subtly competitive with others and not really praising their good things. And even we can do that to ourselves. When we have some success, we can say, well, that's not so great. I can do another thing there, you know, and we don't acknowledge the goodness of whatever happened to us. So it's very important to sort of see the world as clear light, where the feedback is always positive, something like that. Okay. So those are the tenfold things that's really very important. When you just got it for free or nearly or just for a donation and uh, you didn't have to write it in blood on some piece of skin <laughs> with a finger bone, 
You just heard it here. And that's the way it should be. Mental thoughts are actions that have ex evolutionary consequences, in other words. You can kill, hate, steal, covet, abuse sexuality, and be unrealistic, uncaring, by thought, or save, give, uh, save, that is to say love, give, that is to say be generous, and benefit sexuality, be realistic, that means, caring by thought. This means you must learn to think with, your, with love, generosity, and care. Hence, your natural focus on being mindful is for your own evolutionary benefit. And luckily, what benefits you inevitably benefits humanity. That's true. That's how you do it. You know, when you do Bodhisattva vow, you say, I want to save all beings from suffering. But you say, I will do that. The only way I can do that is I will become a perfect Buddha, a transcendent Buddha who can really effectively change the course of affairs. And then I will bring all other beings to becoming Buddhas. So that's really quite marvelous. And you benefit yourself, you benefit others. The human form is more expansive, more expansive than crocodiles and rhinoceri, with greater variety of thought and behavior. It can expand endlessly through memory and imagination, and can also contract dramatically. Killing another being, being another living being, demonstrates the killer's empathetic incorporation of, uh, diminishes, I'm sorry, the, the killer's empathetic incorporation of life, even uh, what initially seems to be another's life. When you, when you kill them, then you're just saying, that life is nothing to me. And the fact that you have it is also meaningful, meaningless to me. I have nothing to do, you have nothing to do with me. I'm not connected to you, it's terrible. The killer thinks he or she drives the victim out of the world and away from her or him forever. But actually, he, only, he or she only cuts the victim's mind connection to the victim's body. Further, he cut off his own empathetic connection to the victim's form of life while reinforcing the paranoia that all others want to cut off his, the killer's life. The victim resents the killer for taking him, her or his life and carries on into his or her never, never uh, next embodiment, at le and at least subliminal intention to take the killer's, with at least a subliminal intention to take the killer's life in revenge. So that's terrible. Then you're creating enemies by killing beings. You're creating terrible enemies. They will come back at you. It is said that the Roman emperor Constantine's wife insisted that the emperor ban the teaching of rebirth in future lives and execute the patriarch Oregon, who vigorously taught the law of metempsychosis, the reincarnation of souls and other bodies, which was prevalent in the Mediterranean in the time of Socrates and Jesus and Augustine and people like that. Reincarnation was a, was a real reality, just like today. People can learn about karma even in the modern times, even though the culture doesn't believe it, but they can find out the knowledge anyway. The reason that, she, 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 that Constantine did that is that this empress, as an empress, she had ordered many executions, and she didn't want anybody who she had ordered educated coming back in the next life and getting her. She feared some of the executed might take rebirth as a being wishing to take revenge on her, so she wanted the possibility banned, naively thinking that an imperial, imperial ban could stop the actual consequences of her actions. Before that, reincarnation or metempsychosis was commonly accepted in Mediterranean cultures and societies. That's really interesting, isn't it? If you think of that in the light of Jesus' statement in the book of Revelation, that I will be back within your generation. So, you know, I'm not really leaving town eternally. His, his, his uh, reincarnation thing is more pragmatic, and he's saying, I'll be back in this lifetime. So don't worry about having a zero investment or a zero plane ride. Okay? 
By contrast, the lifesaver embraces the other's life, identifies with it, expands their own sense of life force by identifying with the other. Saving someone's life is virtu virtually saying, your life is connected to mine. I identify with you. I don't want you to deprive your mind or of its body. My life is greater through your presence. You are present in the self as well. I do, I do demolish. Oh yeah, my life is greater through your presence. You are present in me and I would be less without you. Similarly, when taking what is not given to me, when stealing, I disregard your ownership, I regard your mind, take your thing from you. I negate your mind and take your thing from you. Discount and disidentify with your sense of self as invested in your possession and decrease my identification with your life. When I give to you, I enjoy your ownership of the thing I, I owned previously. I enjoyed it more through your enjoyment of it, so that makes me enjoy it more. I become greater by enjoying with you more things than I can enjoy just on my own. That's really good. That's well put. When I lovingly merge with you, when I can only, which I can only do when I offer you the freedom to give yourself lovingly to me, we become one and at least subliminally we experience self-transcendence in communion with one another. Even if we're not that good as lovers, we subliminally do feel that way. We open our very most sensitive hearts and experience freedom as joy, tasting the true safety of reality beyond the fear of harm or death from any other. Sexuality is the place where any animal and all the more the human mammal naturally identifies with another, even if it's often only momentary. Your self-giving human nature is mobilized and you experience the meaning of boundaries into one and melting of boundaries into one another. You expand your sense of identification. You touch the deepest forms of expression through this, through bliss. Therefore, to use that occasion to be harmful physically or emotionally, either by rape or social destructiveness, breaking others' relations through adultery, causing social conflict, endangering the other. This disconnects you from expanding your identification with the life of someone with whom otherwise you and he or she can experience tremendous interconnection. Speech is the form of action where the self interconnects with others by sharing experience through language. Being heard is being given the privilege of temporarily occupying another's mind. Listening is opening one's own mind to another. When you lie and deceive others, you imprison them in an unreality. You excise them from your reality and lose connection. When you reveal whatever you know of truth to others, you expand your world and you invite others into it. Thank you very much. I will, we will carry on next time. And uh, so uh, I dedicate the merit of this, getting this far up into speech. Uh, for the bit for the that I may quickly become a total Buddha myself, the embodiment of skillful evolutionary action, all ten of them, and just uh, spontaneously doing it without any sense of having to aim for it or control for it, skill becomes my actual body, and uh, artfulness. I become an artist of living, artist of life, artist of drawing breath. And then quickly I'll be able to help others become just equal to me. I'm not doing it to be better than them. I'm not doing it to lord it over them. I'm doing it to be able to help them effectively become just the same. Because it's an infinite task we have. They're infinite suffering beings. We join up with the infinite unsuffering ones and we make it happen sooner for them all. Okay? So that's our dedication. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>